I have the pleasure of serving as chair of the Stewardship Commission for the diocese. And we are thrilled that you are all with us this evening. We're gonna start with a prayer and Zella Forsythe, one of the commission members is going to lead us. Oh Lord, you promised us that when two or three are gathered together in your name, that you will be among us. And we know that you're here, even though we are far apart in distance, but we are here on the screen with you and we know you're with us. You also promised that when we were needing to say something, uh, that you would be here with us and be with our mouth so that we say the right thing. So I'm asking blessings on this presentation and all of the presenters. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Zella. So tonight is the first of what we hope and intend to be many opportunities for us all to gather and talk about the different aspects of stewardship. So tonight's agenda is about annual giving. Jim, you want to pull up the agenda? Slide. I am trying to. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. So we're going to go through, we're going to introduce the commission. One of the things we're going to do is talk about the survey results. Many of you, I hope, participated in the survey. Then we're going to talk about a recap of the 2022 campaign. Reflect on the, on the recent campaign. Start talking about best practices from around the diocese. And then talk about 2023, as well as um, talk about some resources. And so I'd like now to introduce the commission. I'd like to thank uh, Bishop Diane, who is with us tonight, not only for joining us, but for restarting a stewardship commission late last spring and asking us to, to serve in this opportunity. We are all very excited about it and appreciate your support. Would not happen without that. And we're very mm -hmm. aware. So, this is the commission, um, and we're all on. So if you will raise your hand when I say, um, Linda Robertson. I think we have somebody who has feedback. Okay, um, Jim Gilligan, and Jim, thank you so much for handling the PowerPoint and putting it together. Father Isaac, Zella Forsythe, who you saw earlier, and Anita Philbrick. So we are thrilled to be with you today. So I am now going to turn it over to Jim and he's going to talk to us about the survey. Uh, the Stewardship Commission was started, as I mentioned, last April um, by the bishop and we conducted a survey this fall. I think I mentioned that as well already and uh, to gather information so we could understand what you were interested in and that this survey these survey results are what are dri driving our program planning. Um, now, Jim. All right, well, thank you, everyone. So my name is Jim Gilligan. You probably know my wife better than me, who is Elaine, who, who is part of the diocesan staff. And, um, you know, I take my orders from Elaine. So uh, <laughs> complain to her. No, I'm just kidding. So my part here is to go over the results of our stewardship survey, which we conducted earlier uh, or conducted in the fall of 2022. We received 42 responses from 47 congregations in the diocese, which is approximately 90% of the congregations, which is an awesome uh, response rate. So I'm going to go through the survey rather quickly, just so you see what uh, what the Stewardship Commission um, received in terms of responses from everyone for a set of questions to sort of set our direction as to where we want to go in the future. So we, we start off with asking if annual campaigns uh, if everyone conducts a formal annual stewardship campaign. And the answer was that yes, 93% of the congregations actually do conduct a stewardship campaign. So that's the norm. And when then we followed that up, we asked, uh, well, if you do that, do parishioner, do you ask members of your congregation to make pledges annually? So 
Only two congregations reported that their members do not make formal pledges. So 95% of our, of our churches in the diocese uh, members make a pledge. Um, we then asked, does your congregation have a formal stewardship committee? And by that, we mean, is there more than one person on that committee? And almost half of our congregations do not have a formal stewardship committee. So the answer is 40% of our congregations say no, they do not have a formal stewardship committee. Well, if you do have a stewardship committee, we ask, do the members change every year or are they the same members? And of the churches that do have a formal stewardship committee, over a third reported that the same people serve on their parish's stewardship committee every year. We then kind of switch the questions to ask about, do you have a year round stewardship program? We didn't define year round stewardship, but um, meaning do you talk about stewardship more than during your, your campaign? And overwhelmingly, most parishes do not have a year round stewardship campaign or program. 84% of our parishes said they do not have a year round program. Of the ones that do have a year round program, we ask them, uh, well, what do you do? So the most, uh, the, the, the favorite response is we have Sunday sermons, which would obviously fall to the clergy of the church. We do postal mailings, Sunday bulletin inserts. We make announcements on our church website. We send emails. The least used tool for year round stewardship is testimonials from people who are good stewards. We ask how often do you communicate during the church year with your church members on stewardship and only 28% of our parishes said that they communicate more than once or twice a year. You can look at the graph on the right side of this uh, slide and see that the majority of churches only communicate about stewardship during the campaign. Only 5% talk about stewardship weekly, 10% monthly. We asked uh, about your stewardship campaign. Do you create your own stewardship campaign or do you purchase or use a stewardship campaign that is already prepared? Uh, a third of the parishes in the diocese re reported that they purchase or use or supplement a stewardship campaign prepared by a third party. And typically that third party is TENS, which is the Episcopal Network for Stewardship. 65%, two thirds of our parishes create their own stewardship campaign. Now, none of this information is particularly right or wrong. It's just information for you to understand what our churches do in the diocese. We asked everyone, well, how do you want this stewardship committee to help you? And so we ask everyone to rank the issues you believe our commission should prioritize in its work with the churches. And the number one response was how to conduct a pledge campaign. Then we ask parish leadership, uh, how should the Stewardship Commission provide information to ch churches about stewardship? Ranked in order of preference, email was number one, in-person presentations number two, online presentations number three, and via the website, articles and resources was number four. Now in reality, the Stewardship Commission is going to use all of these communication method, methods to uh, communicate with the di diocesan churches. So we, we asked uh, 
uh, survey respondents to rank the issues you believe the Stewardship Commission should prior prioritize in its work with the churches and how to conduct a pledge campaign was the most requested item. And then following that was year round stewardship, messaging, plan giving, recruiting a stewardship committee, online giving, preparing and using a narrative budget, and then conducting a special project or capital campaign. I love how we have technical issues, but everyone following me, of course, I hope. So then we asked how should the Stewardship Commission provide information to ch churches on stewardship? Email was number one, website was the last. And then when we talked about how should the Stewardship Commission provide training to churches about stewardship, Again, online was number one, in person number two, email number three, website number four, and we will use all four of these methods to, to do training in the future. So with that, that is a very, very quick recap of our uh, uh, survey results that we sent out in the fall. And we thank everyone, 90% of the congregations to responding to our survey, a great response. I'm gonna turn this uh, seminar over now to Father Isaac. We're gonna talk about a recap of your own stewardship campaigns. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, so as you see there on the slide with the number one ranked in piece of importance coming from around the diocese was to discuss conducting a pledge campaign. We have tools um, that we want to share, but we also know that there are a variety of tools and gifts and knowledge and wisdom that have been gathered over the years among the diocese. Um, Jim, I'm not sure, I'm still seeing the how you want us to help you slide, um, but we have a few questions that we'd like to open it up very briefly um, for each person, if you would so wish, to recap your 2022 giving campaign and talk about best practices, things you've learned throughout the years. Again, we only have a few minutes for this, so perhaps some, some brief comments, but we know there is wisdom in this group and around the diocese. Um, and so if you'd be so willing to unmute for 30 or 60 seconds or so and share insights or struggles um, in your recent pledge campaign and things you've learned along the way? The most uh, memorable campaign that I've been involved in was a mime, and the mime <clears throat> came up and had, had, had a seat, and uh, of course, mimes don't say anything, and then um, there, the, the mime uh, was praying, and all of a sudden, somebody from the other side uh, was poking her, and she had a uh, mind holding the the plate, and then uh, opened her purse or something and put something in there, and then she looked up, uh, oh, pretending that she was talking to God, and said, "All right," and pulled out some more money and put it in, and then it looked up again, no, 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 no. And all of a sudden, uh, she grabbed the plate, put it down on the floor, and stepped in it and mimed, uh, not just your money, give your whole self, everything, give, give everything to the Lord. <laughs> That's powerful. Thank you, Zella. <laughs> Who else would be willing to share, either from your 2022 campaign or... Um, from from prior years, things things you've learned, things that have been been perhaps a struggle or some amazing successes anywhere around. Um, Larry, I see your hand up. Indeed, uh, Saint Mary Magdalene has a tradition of using uh, people's testimonies, and we use we try to invite different people. And by a testimony, I mean they'll they'll say they'll they'll share why are they a member of our congregation and why that's important in their life and why making a pledge is. So it's very simple, but I, I find, uh, especially in a smaller community, um, those personal witnesses have a real power. Sure, thank you for sharing that. I'll share an example from one of the congregations I serve. Last year, we added the option for an online pledge card. We just created a page on our website and simple form like you would have a physical one, but just online, and it shoots an email to 
the treasurer. And so it's submitted in that way. And our number and amount of pledges, um, we've we've seen increases over the last couple of years simply by making that option available. Um, so just one one tidbit I'd personally share. Walker. Uh, hi, I'm Walker Adams. Um, I recognize I'm in a little bit of a different ministry context to being at an, an Episcopal University, um, but um, we pray for money around here, which I think is really important um, and part of our stewardship. In fact, um, on Sunday, we announced that we just got a $4 million gift to the university choir from um, a graduate who got up and said that um, the line in the university prayer that asks for a never failing succession of benefactors um, sort of moved them as college students um, and them thinking, you know, what does that mean and how can I be one? Um, and now 30 years later, they've sold a company that raised a lot of money and are, <laughs> are now giving it uh, back to the places where they, they want to be benefactors. But making that connection uh, between what are we raising funds for and where does where does money come from and, and how do we we pray for its collection and, and right use I think is important. Thank you Walker that's what a story. Um, Tom Cook here see your hand. Hey all good to see you this evening. Uh, this is kind of a theme that I, I would like to take us on as far as the diocese goes, and for those of you that have heard me speak at convention, and when I was asked to uh, become treasurer of the diocese, the thing I asked myself was, what are the benefits, benefits of a hierarchical church or ecclesiast ecclesiastical uh, setup? And we just accomplish so much more as a diocese than we can as a single parish in helping the community and whatnot. And we've, I've gone through my, my spiel at convention, but I, I think it's important and I think we do a good job at it, uh, at pointing that out with the diocese and certainly at convention. And I think that's one of the things at least once a year or twice a year at our parishes, we should accentuate. And um, anyway, my two cents on that. Thank you, Tom. I agree, that's a powerful message. Who else, who else has a, a story, an anecdote? Anyone have a, a failure you'd like to perhaps not like to share, but that might be beneficial for the rest of the group to hear um, that we can collectively learn from. Or a success too, feel free to share those. Yes, Amy. Um, I don't know that it was a failure, but we were not as successful as we could have been um, at a, a previous church in another state um, when we did not involve enough people in the stewardship committee that we weren't broad enough um, in helping reach out and then using those voices throughout the parish, um, keeping it to a very small group. That might work better in some places, but in this parish, I think we really missed, missed the mark some. On the other side, one of the things we did um, at Christ Church is we started for the first time having a opening celebration to our campaign. Instead of just a wonderful closing one, we actually opened with something. So we we sort of had we'd had two letters going out, and then we on that day we we had a party at the church, and I think that really helped. It it reminded um, people about the sense of community uh, because everything else you're doing is very individual. So I think that's going to stick around for a while. Absolutely. Um, Brother Larry, would you be willing to share what allowed what you shared in the chat? I just mentioned that, you know, that one uh, uh, more spirituality based resource that is really helpful is a collection of sayings by Henry Nouwen simply called a spirituality of fundraising. Uh, it is used by a lot of groups uh, 
uh, the, where I became aware of it was through Dennis Green's uh, uh, group here in Kansas City, which is called Church Development. And they've really found that by exploring the spirituality of fundraising, it changes the tone of this whole uh, needed effort that we uh, go through consistently. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone else? We've got another moment or so. Any other stories? Yes, Regina. Two things. Well, first of all, a failure probably everyone would love to have. But my church in New Jersey, years ago, decided on a million dollar capital campaign. We got in a consultant. He said, okay, what you do is first, before the official launch, you have a quiet campaign among the church leadership. And that way, when you have the official kickoff, you can tell everybody, wow, we've already got this much pledged. We got, I don't know who, I don't know how. When they had the kickoff dinner, they had already gotten a million dollars in pledges. The pledges that came in from the rest totaled $100,000. It was almost like everyone said, oh, hey, we're done. Somebody else took care of it. And I think we need to make sure that everyone feels like they're participating and they have a purpose. One of the things I wanted to emphasize was the time and the talents, because we have people who are on fixed incomes. They don't have a lot of money. And first of all, you need to let them know, hey, we don't just love you for the amount of the check you can write. You are a member of our community. And the other thing is I can tell you personally, the more involved you get in how the church is run and what the church needs, you get more confidence that, oh, my money is doing good stuff. So you really need to get the time and the talents involved too. Excellent. Thank you. Important reminder. Are there others? Father Isaac, I'll make a comment. Sure. This is Jim Gilligan. So um, I'm sort of ashamed to admit since I'm a participant in this uh, stewardship webinar that our church, unfortunately, <laughs> sort of has a uh, the, the practice of having the same people on the stewardship committee every year, which falls to me as the treasurer who's been the treasurer for literally decades at the church. Um, and I would characterize the annual giving campaign at Resurrection in Blue Springs as low key. Um, I'm not particularly proud of that, but I say often, and people will know I say this, that the pocket depths of people are much deeper than, than what, what people often give. And Resurrection will respond when they're, they feel there's a need. And when there is a need, um, the money comes forth. If there's not, it's kind of like pull it out of my pocket. I don't know that that that's very, you know, what I can tell you how to change that. But I do think that having the same campaign year after year is is not the best way to conduct a a stewardship campaign. It should be um a spiritual campaign. It should be a sharing of everyone's faith, um, talking about what it is that why we give and why uh, our giving benefits the church and the and the bigger community. And I agree. I believe it, Larry, that said this: that uh, testimonials are a very, very powerful way for congregations to. Um, uh, embrace stewardship it's a personal and a very religious and spiritual way for people to connect um, their giving to coming to church so i i don't have any silver bullet but i do think that doing the same old thing year after year after year results in the same old thing year after year after year and so being different being innovative being spiritual will bring your congregation a better result in the in the stewardship campaign. And I also believe that very truly believe this that uh, 
people, I, I say this to people are on their own journey in stewardship and in their, in their spiritual lives. You cannot judge when I, I've been the campaign chairman so, so long. I cannot judge people for why they make their own personal decisions, nor will I judge people. They, people will not necessarily share why or why they don't do things. But I do know that having people participate in the life of the church, coming to church, having um, participating in weekly worship will increase their stewardship. So part of my suggestion to everyone is just don't concentrate on the stewardship campaign during the stewardship part of the year. Get people involved in the church and make them realize the benefit and um, they the stewardship will follow. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Bishop Bruce, I think I saw your hand up. Um, I want to just echo a little bit about what Jim said. I think year-round stewardship is really key. Um, clergy being able to preach about uh, preach about stewardship because, you know, every really every Sunday is a mini stewardship Sunday because there's always something in the Gospels or the readings about generosity or giving or sharing. Um, you know, my my big thing is I think that the miracle of the feeding of the five thousand was not that was absolutely that Jesus you know blessed and and things happened. Uh, there was enough fish and bread, but my bigger miracle would have been that the people actually all brought something that they were kind of trying to guard and hide because they didn't their their neighbor had or you know would need. Um, but with Jesus's activity, um, people must have opened up their own baskets and started to share um, because everything we have, everything we do, everything we are is a gift from God and it's a gift that meant, that's meant to be shared. Um, as a parish priest, uh, I had 12 members on my vestry. I was blessed by that. And, you know, every month somebody had the opportunity to come, whoever signed up for that month on the vestry, because there's 12 months in the year. Uh, came to all the services, and there were three, um, and they talked about how they came to come to the church, uh, what they do on the vestry, if there was any needs for that area, and why they pledge. And so I used the vestry members as my mini, you know, my mini uh, testimonial uh, every month, um, and that that worked out well. And if you've got a smaller vestry, you can, can kind of double them up. Um, and I do agree that keeping things fresh every year, um, looking at, you know, having a different stewardship campaign, um, and TENS is really great about that. If you uh, don't have the imagination to come up with that on your own. Um, yeah, so I love stewardship. It's like my favorite thing. And one last thing I'll say, uh, as a parish priest and as a bishop, um, when I was a parish priest, especially, uh, people always knew. Uh, because the treasurer and the bookkeeper knew that I paid my pledge, I paid my pledge on time as a parish priest, because I felt like I had to set the example for everyone else. Um, and everybody knew that we practiced in my family, the biblical tithe. Um, and, and we kept that, we kept that practice up. And I still keep that practice up. Um, I think it's important for the clergy to set that example and for the lay leaders to, as they can to set that example. Um, and I always would ask people to start to move towards the biblical tithe. Um, and, you know, people are, are at a different, you know, rates in their lives, right? Um, it's been wonderful and a, a great blessing uh, because we always ended up having enough. Uh, when we gave from our first fruits, we always had enough. So I'll be quiet. Thank you, Bishop. Really appreciate that. So we've heard a lot of wisdom from all around the diocese, uh, lots of best practices, um, and lots of stories and anecdotes. I'll turn it over now to Anita, who I think is going to lead us into some more structured and um, um, provided steps to, to help all of us, wherever we are in the journey, have a perhaps a new plan or a few new to us tidbits. Okay. Well, um... I'm Ed Brick, and I'm from St. Thomas the Beckett. Now, St. Thomas the Beckett is in the southwest corner of the state, and we have 24 people on our rolls. I mean, that's it. 
and 17 of them come on a regular basis. And so I represent small congregations, small rural congregations, and sometimes small rural congregations don't uh, do as formal of a campaign, or sometimes they just let the campaign go. So I just want to remind small churches that you also need to have a stewardship program and um, maybe even a little more formal than usual. But I'm going to talk about some uh, of the principles that come off of the TINS um, site. And I'm going to go through each point just and give a few little highlights. There's a lot, lot, lot more stuff on the TINS uh, site. So go ahead and go there after I've spoken and um, check that out because I can't say everything in this little short time that I have. So what I'm saying that is these points will work for large churches and for small churches too. So the first point is that you need to organize a stewardship ministry team. And you'll need a, a general chair, a chair for a year round, a chair to pledge for the pledge drive, and someone to keep track of staff like a clerk. Uh, when you're looking for people to serve on the team, I encourage you to start to try to think outside of the box. I know it's tempting to ask the accountant, the businessman, the treasurer that's been on there for thousands of years, the highly successful people in your congregation. But I'm going to suggest that you try thinking about the 80 year old woman with a heart for stewardship who dearly loves God and the congregation. Or think about that personable young man who may be a little new to the church, but seems to know everybody and is loved by everybody in the congregation. Or that stay-at-home mom that is an absolutely wonderful organizer. We said that, we, that two thirds of the congregations have the same people on this on the committees and I'm encouraging you to think, rethink your committee and to add some different kinds of people to be sh be sure that you take into consideration the demographics of the congregation because often what ends up on the committee are um, successful men and women who are are very this much the same. So be sure to think about diversity and age, race and gender. In other words, your stewardship team should be a microcosm of the congregation as a whole. The second point is to design and select the most appropriate program. As you will see later, there are lots of resources out there. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. But before you just take the easy way and just grab any old program, I encourage you to prayerfully ask yourself if it's the right one for your congregation. Consider the congregation's spiritual condition, their sense of mission and leadership, mission and vision, their leadership, their energy. Some churches are made up of a lot of very elderly people and energy is not as strong. Their successes and fail, the successes and failures are the best. Consider how you want to tell your story. Think about what else goes on in your congregation and how the stewardship program can be integrated into the overall program that, of the church. And here's my main point. Always, always remember that the emphasis of stewardship is to further the work of God, not to maintain the building or the programs. The third thing is to solicit vestry and bishop committee support. Present the plan to the leadership for approval and identify the level of involvement you want each member of the vestry to support the program. You need their buy-in. You definitely need the buy-in if you're going to be successful. Some congregations even ask vestry members to pledge first before asking the congregation to do so, and they can be your main first testimonies. I, I'm on the vestry, and why am I doing this, and why do I pledge? Involve the, 
clergy and pastoral conversations. It's important to involve the clergy as he or she may be privy to some information that they cannot share with you, but that will help you handle it, handle your stewardship campaign. They also can give sermons, as Bishop Bruce said, year round to help with the stewardship um, with your pledge drive later on in the year. Um, educate. Now we're going to have a seminar on this later on stewardship education and year round stewardship. So I won't dwell on this. However, one of the most important areas of educating the congregation is the opportunity for to hear the witness of other voices in the congregation. I testimonials, they said, was the least used and I think it's one of the most effective because people can talk about what God and the church has done for them, what God is inviting them to do, uh, how they can respond and so on. And my daughter has a church up in, she works in a church up in um, Marblehead, Massachusetts. It had been having annual meetings since 17, 15, if you can believe that. Uh, they just had their annual meeting last week and said 1715 was the first annual meeting that they had. And all during their stewardship campaign, they have people getting up right at the end of the service during the announcements and giving their testimony. And they're, they're given a full maybe five minutes to give their testimonies. And some of them have been absolutely touching and beautiful what God has done for them. And I think we're missing the boat if we don't use, we can also do this in written form. We can send witness statements out to people uh, that don't focus on here, give us their, all this money, but what the person who is writing the statement uh, has to share, her testimony, her response, uh, the difference the church has made in their life and how supporting the church has made a difference in their life and an invitation to join them. It's kind of a type of evangelism. Um, the, no, the seventh point is a response system. And this is just nuts and bolts, of course. I'm just gonna give some examples. Uh, distributions include mailings that include a letter, mailings with a brochure explaining the current vision and mission of the church distribution of pledge cards at a festive meal at the very, very beginning, which somebody spoke of, and I think that's a wonderful idea, with follow-up mailings to those who don't respond. Or here's another one, small groups, getting together just small stewardship groups. I think that would be a great idea. And then of course, responding, mail, placement, in the offering plate, making a big ceremony in the contents text of worship and so on. This is up to the team to decide according to the type of congregation. In small churches like mine, it can be much more simple than it would be in large churches. And when the campaign is over, acknowledgement. I am a very much believer in a handwritten note. I still write handwritten notes. I really don't like email. In fact, I just cleared out my email of 200 messages because I hadn't been paying attention to it. And so I would prefer somebody wrote me a note and said, thank you very much. I would love it not to look like a bank statement, but, but an expression of gratitude of how the gift will make a difference in the life of the congregation. I know in a large congregation, this is, would be a lot of hard work, but you do have a committee and the work can be divided up. Um, follow up on those who do not pledge. Um, the usual thing is about two weeks grace after pledge Sunday. And then you need to contact them somehow through mail, email,
Anita was having trouble with the internet. There she comes. Okay. Um, if they've been regular givers, then a call or a visit might be in order, particularly if they've been have been giving and then all of a sudden they don't. Um, I used to uh, I took some training in being a listener and a, a personal visit, maybe not maybe not saying I'm coming to visit to talk about your pledge, but I'm coming to visit to talk to you, with you, to listen to you and to sit and listen. And sometimes that'll help get in, insights into what's going on in the um, family and that sort of thing. And not making it about money at all, but making it about pastoral care. Um, celebrate and reward workers. Uh, you can do this with a thank you note. You can recognize them in the service. You can put their names in the bulletin. You can have a special party for them. But everyone likes to be appreciated. And if somebody is the treasurer for years and years and years, like I heard, they really need to be appreciated. They need to know that um, the congregation is not taking them for granted, especially people who've been on the committee for a long, long time still need a lots of thanks. And finally, what we were talking about evaluation, what worked, what didn't work, how might we do things differently, totally non-judgmental time of just sharing and saying, what can we do differently? Because you know, if you keep doing this, the things the same way, you're going to get the same results. So do you have any questions, comments, ideas of your own? You've already kind of given a lot of ideas, but um, go to the TIN site uh, if you want to know more about this. Thanks, Anita. It looks like you have one, Regina. Yeah. Um, one thing that really struck me was the um, visit. My late husband was the treasurer of a church in New Jersey, and two things. First of all, uh, what the priest wanted to know was not who was donating what, but if someone's pledge increased substantially or decreased substantially. Um, the priest wanted to know because he felt that there must, there may be some pastoral reason and, you know, you don't go in and talk about, oh, well, I know what's happening with your pledge, but just kind of explore and see if there's something going on that you need to know about. Um, oh yeah, the other thing was, I remember him he, when he was treasurer, once determining that a woman who, as far as he knew, was on a teacher's salary, was practically triple tithing. And he just said to the priest, you know, I think so-and-so might try and be buying her way into heaven and you might want to talk to her. So it's, you know, sometimes there are pastoral things that need to be addressed. I very much agree with that. Anyone else? Thanks, Anita. That was great. I think now we'll transition to some resources and ask Linda Robertson to visit. I'm uh, Linda Robertson from uh, St. John Springfield and I've been involved in stewardship one way or another for a long time. TEN, uh, as we have mentioned, is a great resource uh, for all sorts of things uh, regarding stewardship. Uh, your year-round program, uh, it's free. The um, password has been posted. The diocese does pay for a membership every year, so it's open to all congregations in the diocese. Uh, it does take a password. Uh, which is posted. Now, if you try to log on to TINS and your password doesn't work, first make sure that you have caps and small letters in the right place and you don't have any spaces in, in there. It, it's all run together. That messes people up. Uh, 
And also they tend to change it every year. So it may be that your password is out of date and you need to check with uh, the office and, and uh, yeah, it works today for me. So um, you can customize this, you can use bits and pieces, uh, you can uh, augment their, 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 uh, their, their logo and, you know, make little, uh, little posters out of it. Um, what they furnish is the bit in the middle. You can stick stuff around it and stick it up on a bulletin board or something. I mean, you could do all kinds of stuff with it. Uh, but basically, uh, they will give you um, things that are useful for uh, for mailings, for um, readings uh, to the congregation, for putting in your uh, newsletter. Uh, all, all sorts of uh, materials. If you don't know tens, um, you, sh you should meet tens. Uh, there are also a variety of other uh, sources. Next slide, please. Uh, the Episcopal Church Foundation has uh, lots of good stuff uh, and also not directly concerned with uh, stewardship exclusively. Uh, they do a publication called Vestry Papers, uh, which is quite good. Uh, they offer webinars on a variety of topics. Uh, and don't worry too much about jotting down all of these uh, uh, addresses. I mean, feel free if you want to, but we will send them to you later. Um, so the Episcopal Church Foundation is very good. The Episcopal Parish Network. Um, for some of you who have been around as long as I have, you may have known that under a different name, which was the Consortium of Endowed Episcopal Parishes. Uh, since COVID, they have kind of re refocused, adapted, um, that sort of thing. And, and they offer free, uh, lots of uh, really good, uh, information. Um, the Diocese of Olympia, you may not have thought about, but they have amazing stuff on their website. Uh, lots of stuff that is available to, to use and uh, very well done. Uh, church development, they specialize in, in cap campaigns. Uh, but they also do a lot with uh, stewardship resources. Again, they're free, not for the capital campaign stuff. That can get pricey. But uh, Dennis Green is, is very good. And uh, his, his people are, are very good at producing good stuff. And um, if, if you use uh, uh, things like bulletin boxes in your, uh, in your programs for, for each Sunday, uh, or if you have a separate announcement sheet or something like that. Um, it's just, you know, you can copy and paste. It's great. And um, there are a number of other, other resources, but these would probably be the ones I would nominate first. Um, I, I, just as a little promo, uh, we do in March have another similar kind of thing coming up and the theme is year-round stewardship. So there'll be more resources there. And uh, somebody mentioned time and talent, which are crucial. Um, those will be highlighted as part of the year-round stewardship. Uh, and also it does uh, additional other uh, uh, resources. So does anybody have uh, questions about resources at this point? No, one of the things, this is Tom, I, one of the things I would mention um, that appears to have been pretty successful at St. Andrews is, and, and also at the diocesan level, as far as giving goes, doing online and offering ACH monthly, um, you know, contributions to your yearly pledge, because I, I feel like my wife and I, we give what we feel is appropriate to give, um, which is, you know, it's not a small amount, but when you do it monthly, 
it's we budgeted in and um, now the resources even for smaller parishes are there to offer that up it basically makes it painless as far as the uh, pledge you know process goes and that's one of the things I probably should talk more about when I'm standing in front of delegates and whatnot, but we certainly can push that further. That's a that's an excellent point. Uh, we have a number of people at St. John's who, who give that way. Right. Also, the diocese provides PayPal to any parish free of charge right. if you don't already have an online giving vendor. So that's a great opportunity too. I agree. Any other questions or, or comments about resources at this point? I'll turn it back to Amy. Thank you, Linda. Well, we hope you now have some new ideas and resources to work, pray, and give for the spread of the kingdom of God. I wanted to also share with you a few upcoming opportunities. Um, TENS has two webinars coming up, one about creating budgets that support your mission and recruiting and training stewardship committee, which Anita talked about this evening. And then our next webinar is promoting year-round stewardship on Tuesday, March 21st. Um, promoting year-round stewardship was the number two request on the survey, so we're excited to be able to bring that to you as well. We look forward to hearing from you about any ideas you have that you would like us to pursue other information and we're so glad you joined us this evening and in closing i'd like zella to um, offer a prayer lord we're going forth in your name we've been concentrating here on how to serve you best with our money and our resources and all of the things that we do I'm going to close now, Lord, with the prayer from Bishop Newman. May he support us all the day long till the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in his mercy, may he give us a safe lodging and a holy rest and a peace the last. Let us go forth in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And also, I want to thank Gary Allman, who's behind um, this as well, and sending out some of these messages, and Emily Davenport, who's not with us, but who has helped us plan this as well. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good -bye. work. Thank you.